edition of Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Samwar. We are delighted to introduce session number 22, Requiem Days of Future Past. Let's welcome our speakers, KK N. Dharuwala, Neelam Saran Gaur, Aruna Chakravarti, in conversation with Dev Priya Roy. This session is presented by the Tribune. Can we all applaud for them? Please come on. I'll call them. Hello, good afternoon. It's wonderful to see all of you here. One worries a little bit about a post-lunch session. So for a post-lunch session, I think this is a great audience. Um, I think we shall begin. We are here today to talk about three extraordinary novels that have been published in India in the last uh, couple of years. Keki Daruwala's Swerving to Solitude, Letters to Mama, and Neelam Saran Gaur's Requiem in Raga Janki, both published in 2018, and Aruna Chakravarti's hot off the press Sura Lakshmi Villa. It's, it's literally just out, right? Um, all the novels excavate the past. In complex ways, all three of them honor the dead, which is why the requiem of the title of the session. And all three of them, in profound ways, celebrate their female protagonists. Largely, we will return to these three themes again and again. But to begin, I wanted to ask all three of you a question that invariably interests me every time I pick up a novel and read it. I always think that every novel has a shadow novel behind it, which is the story how that novel came to be, how the writer came to choose that idea and then write about it. So I thought, should we start with you, Neelamji? Was there a moment when you knew you wanted to write about Janki Chappan Churi and you want to tell everyone a little bit about it? Uh, you couldn't have asked me a better question. Because there really was one micro moment in which this decision to write this book happened to me. I am labeled as that Allahabad person. You know, in literary <laughs> circles, I wear right. this label around my neck. I was researching the uh, culture of Allahabad for another book. I was reading about the iconic people in the history of my city. And I came across two chapters on a singer called Janki Bai, whose name was familiar to me, but beyond the name, there was Absolutely. nothing I knew. Right. And as I read about her, I felt extremely drawn to her. And I made up my mind sometime in the future, you know, I just uh, ticked that off as one of my potential subjects. Mm. So I came to that 10 years down the line, mm. but then I, I did write it. And Janki Bai is somebody I hadn't heard about, even though when you, can't hear? 
Nobody has heard about Janki Bai. So, so it is really honoring the dead. She was this great Hindustani classical singer, and she was a, a, a pioneering woman in her time. So you will talk a little bit more about her, and, we, and uh, Neelam will read from the book as well. Uh, Sura Lakshmi Villa, or uh, shall I come to Keki? Keki, the fascinating thing about Letters to Mama is Sorry. the complex... So the fascinating thing about Letters to Mama is the complex mother-daughter relationship at the heart of it. There's Seema, the daughter, the one who's writing the letters to an absent mother uh, in, during the emergency. There is Shell, the mother, who interestingly was secretary to M.N. Roy once upon a time, another forgotten, semi-forgotten uh, man. And uh, what I thought was the third character in this book the decade from 75 to 85, a sort of a dark decade for India, really, in so many ways. Many of our decades are dark. <laughs> so what I wanted to ask is that who did you begin with? Did you begin with the daughter or the mother when you, when you wanted to write this novel, when you thought of this novel? When I thought of the novel, I first wrote the journal the start from 1900 or right. thereabouts, you know, right. and she goes through all the right. travails. Right. And then she goes off to uh, Mexico with her father. And I wrote that first because that was the most difficult right. part, you know. Right. Then you change it, you chip and chop. Right. But uh, the Mexican history comes in then M. N. Roy uh, establishing the first communist government uh, or party outside uh, the Soviet Union. It was not the Soviet Union, right. it was Russia at the right. moment. So uh, that was the start. Right, so you began with a historical, with a historical kernel and Seema came later. Uh, but uh, the personal gets in, I mean the personal mm. of, the, of Shell, mm. the the mother hmm. uh, gets in throughout hmm. the... Uh, I right. mean, she feels uh, someone rejected by, uh, right. by Eamon Roy, let's face it. Right, right. Uh, a, a, a fascinating book. And I read uh, his autobiography, I'd read books on Eamon Roy. Uh, to write a novel, you have to, you know, work of course. really hard. Of course. It's not, it's not waffling. Right. Uh, it's solid work. No, we'll, we'll, come to, we'll come to the, re the research as well. I'll just bring in Arunadi first. Uh, Arunadi, Sura Lakshmi Villa, this gorgeous novel, it's an epic novel. There are two, two families of sisters and, um, and their stories over, over the decades, right? But you write in the acknowledgments that this was first a short story. So how did the kernel become the seed, become the banyan tree of the novel? <laughs> well, uh, it's an interesting story because it isn't about anybody important like my co-panelists uh, have written about. This, uh, the whole thing started in the 60s when I was teaching in uh, Janki Devi Memorial College. And in the English department, uh, there was a lady, a South Indian lady, um, and she told me a, a strange uh, story about her mother-in-law. Mm. She said that her mother-in-law... Uh, was apparently quite, apparently happily married and had a son. And, uh, and then suddenly out of the blue, after six years, she just upped and left. Right. Left, left her husband, son, mm. everything. Right. And, and, and uh, this was in, uh, she was a South Indian. So this was, um, uh, they were in Chennai. She left Chennai and she went to uh, an obscure village in Tamil right. Nadu and started teaching in a school. Right. And she never came back. Now, for some reason, that story, and apparently my friend either didn't know if anything had happened or didn't wish to share it with me. So there were no facts. I mean, all I knew was there was this lady um, and she had this husband and son and she left them and walked out. Mm -hmm. But for some strange reason, this lady just stuck in my head. Right. This was in the 60s that I heard the story. Right. And the 
uh, what had happened had happened in the 20s, 1920s. Oh, oh. So I, I thought that for that age and time, to, do, to take such an action was so, so went Gutsy. so beyond right. uh, you know, societal expectations. The kind of uh, guts this woman must have shown and the, the passion, she, I mean, she must have felt something very, very strong in order to make her do this, but what could it have, what been? Could it have been? What could it right. have been? So I, and somehow I kept thinking about her, thinking about her, and um, came to no conclusion. But there was something strange, you know. I didn't, I didn't visualize her as a, a selfish, self-centered woman who gave up her responsibilities to mm. lead her own life, who had no, her maternal mm. instincts were very, very, right. you know, right. uh, very uh, definitely not, not to be complimented. So I didn't see her like that. For some strange reason, I saw her as a tragic character. Right. And whenever, even when I thought of her, the image that I built up in my mind was of someone who had suffered and was suffering, you know. And everything that she, was, that she was going through, a tragic woman. And of course, she just stayed in my head. I didn't write about her. I didn't think about her. I mean, I thought about her, but I didn't write. Till, um, I think in 2006 or seven, I wrote a short story, which was a part of a collection, uh, which was published um, uh, under the name Secret Spaces. It was about eight women, you know, from different walks and different uh, parts of India. And each of them had this little secret space right. within them. Right. And she was one of the characters that I wrote about. It's a lovely, it's a lovely book. You know, with uh, Neelam, what I wanted to ask you is that with what uh, Arunadi just said, that this woman stuck in my head. She got in there and she refused to leave till her story was written 80 years ago, nearly, nearly 100 years after she lived. Something similar that you write in, uh, in Requiem, that Janaki sort of entered your house, your household, your family, became a kind of a family member and stuck on. Now, this was a very difficult book to record because women's stories, they disappear. Janaki Bai uh, Alabadi was such a great classical singer, but how many of us had heard of her before, before you wrote the book? So how did you research, how did you do this kind of monumental research to recreate her, her life? What were the sources? Uh, first of all, I didn't think of it as a woman's book. Hmm. Uh, she struck me as an artist. Right. Fundamentally an artist whose life had gone unrecorded. Other than that, I would say that I used the book as a kind of... Uh, uh, post to hang a number of other things. One of them was the history of music. Right. Because there are these right. treasures of, you know, uh, folklore about Hindustani classical music, music, which I grew up hearing. And uh, I felt they have to be written down. Right. Because a lot of it is just oral narrative. And uh, it is so beautifully intermingled with the training mm. or in classical music, mm. no one's really looked upon it as in a, from a storyteller's Were you eye. trained in classical no, music? No, I wasn't, but my father was. So I grew up with these stories blowing around me, and mm. I really wanted to record them. Mm. And the most important thing is why I called it Requiem, was I was writing about an inclusive time. Right. A time in the world of music when it just did not matter what your religious denomination was. Because your faith was your art. Right. And how that played out. So for me, it wasn't really a woman's story, one right. woman's story. You know, it, that woman's mm. story just happened to she was a woman. Mm. I could have she written a about artist. a man. Right. 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 It is the artistic quest that powers her throughout. And if I can butt in. Uh, this used to happen in the 50s, in the 60s. I studied in a Urdu school and I, find, I found Muslims writing on Ram and, you know, Ruksa tu avo baap se lekar khuda ka naam rahe wafa ki manzil e avval hui tamam. And the master told us, what is the rahe wafa ki manzil? And he said, this is obeying the parents. The first road to, on, of loyalty 
is right. obeying the parents. Right. Now, I believe uh, there was a Muslim actor and he was shunted out in the, in the South uh, a year back or two, uh, or, uh, or two years back. That shouldn't be happening. We were I mean, traditionally, Ram Leela performances always had Muslim actors playing Ram and Lakshman. Right. So, um, we'll, we'll come back to this again. But you, you did mention the amount of research that you had to do, and you, in fact, began with the research about M.N. Roy, about the, the Kamagata Maru incident is there in the book. There's a lot, of, a lot of history in the book. But right from the start, I mean, you talked about shadows before the book. Uh, one shadow before the book was that it came out to my mind as an allegory of what is happening these days in this right. century, you know, right. uh, especially after the 1990s. Right. So, uh, the subconscious has a very big hand and I have passages which are not reflective of the subconscious, they are reflective of my absolute opinions about what is going on. Right. So, uh, I would say, when seeing the title of the, uh, this, of the uh, panel. whatever, yeah. uh, that it is not just a requiem, it is also a dirge on the present. Right. In fact, the historical present, even when we are excavating the past, as you've, all three of you have done in the book, the historical impulse of the present is what, um, I think, perfects our filters through which we look. In your case, what would you say? For example, somebody like Edun, the other, the, the other sisters, right? A very impoverished, landless family of Muslims living in a part of Bengal, who again follow a curiously syncretic religion. Um, but Edun belongs to that subaltern history where there are no records of those lives, right? How did you, re how, what was your sort of historical, how, what was your historical method in excavating that life? You've done it so beautifully uh, and I kept wondering. Actually, you know, in, in this case, the research was purely speaking to various people. Right. Because there is really nothing written about it. So I spoke to various, um, you're talking about the, the Muslim part of the book, yeah. So uh, there I spoke to, you know, uh, uh, servants, maids. Then, of course, I did a trip to gold, and I actually saw the way they live. You know, the, These, the, this particular family, the very mm, impoverished. Uh, of course, uh, this, the, the family landless. is fiction. Family yeah. is imagined. Yeah, right. But I did uh, go to Malda uh, once. I paid a visit, and I paid a visit to gold, which is the ancient capital of Bengal, which was ruled over by the Sen kings, Sen mm. and Pal kings. So, uh, and they have these mm. beautiful palaces, terracotta palaces, which are now absolutely ruined. There's no conservation in West Bengal. And they've been turned into uh, almost slums. I mean, people, landless people, homeless people have just Live found there. their way there. So I saw a lot of these Muslim, very, very poor, the dregs of uh, society, more or less, just clustering there and making a living. So somehow the way, I mean, the whole contrast between, you know, people from the lowest strata of society living in palaces which, in which once kings and queens lived, that also captured my imagination and that's how I, I thought of Idun and Idun's family. There's, there are no records that I studied or anything. Right. But because you know, it's set in the 50s, right? It's yes. 50, 56, uh, uh, 57. 50s, 60s, and 70s. But here, you know, what I was trying to do was that there are, there are these two parallel, the two families, like mm -hmm. there's this family in Malda. Then there is this very wealthy, very enlightened, you know, cosmopolitan Bengali family in, uh, in living in Delhi. And you were, you know, you, you sort of began by saying how they were families of sisters. There were five sisters in one, four sisters in, in the another. other. And, but strangely, even though their, their economic situation yes, economic is very different. In every other way, the situations are so totally different. There are parallels, distinct parallels between them. So that was, uh, so this uh, somehow just, uh, uh, this just happened. Frankly, I don't know why it happened, how it happened. 
And uh, Sura Lakshmi, the, the central character, the one that I picked up from the lady that I was speaking to you about earlier, the lady who left her husband and child, she kind of straddles the two worlds. Right. She's born in one world, but she rejects that and right. makes her life with the other world. Right. Because she feels that that is where she really belongs, right. where she can do something, she can contribute. Something. Right. Right. So should we uh, listen to you read from the books? Because uh, the prose is, is, is gorgeous in all three and very different. So. I don't know what passage to read. I'll read a very short passage. As I told you, a book about the past often becomes an allegory. So, when we had the award, Vapsi, uh, that whole thing right. in 2015, uh, there was an actor from uh, Bollywood who came out with a procession in Delhi and he was welcomed and he, there were passages in it where it said in sahitya karo ko jute maro salo ko etc etc other aesthetic uh, epithets right. if one may uh, talk about it right and i said why shouldn't i bring in uh, the same fellow uh, in 19 um, whatever, 80, um, 75 or 76. So here it is, this is a very short one and then I'll come out mm. with, a, with a right. another pas passage if I may. Right. Right. Look friends, this fellow is an ordinary not anki chap, but now he becomes a leader, he becomes a part of the uh, then Congress, the emergency Congress if I may call it, and he says, Look, friends, leadery is no joke. It is a God-given talent. One out of many millions has it, this quality. Indraji has it from her sanskar. What kind of country are we? You have heard the saying, seven kanojiyas, nine cooking fires. Can such a country progress? Six people sit at breakfast. One wants alu paratha. Another, methi ki roti. A third wants fried eggs. It goes on. Mrs. Gandhi says, only alu ka paratha today. Nothing else. And some yogurt. Jolly well eat and be happy. Eat and smile. Now that is discipline, he says. That is leadery. <laughs> so... Then, when you are writing a novel, you are a part of the novel and any stray incident can spark off Absolutely. half the novel. Right. I was reading a book at my daughter's house in Dubai and I found the word occult and the word occult stuck in my mind and within two or three days there was a character uh, her name is Elham, and even the uh, character Elham is Arabic, you know, it is not the Indian Muslim who is called Elham. And she becomes the occult, and she presages, mm. and she says, Mrs. Gandhi will be in jail, and uh, Within goes a year. On. it goes on and on. I'll, I'll just read a page. And then people think that there is a bhut in a, within her and exorcism is, a, is a very well known, especially in societies which are not very rational. And uh, uh, this scene is set in Lucknow. Much of this is set in Lucknow, the book. And this man, 
the chap called Azmatullah, who is the foe Molvi of the place. He comes out, uh, he wants to exorcise the Bhut, and they come to Shalini. Shalini is the main narrator of the novel, uh, you can call it, call her a heroine, and uh, he brings a crowd of a dozen people or more, and the matter goes, and he starts by saying, you are aware, Thakurayan Simaji, that it is a sin to keep a jinn in the body. Holy cow, she is narrating the yes. holy cow. How was I to answer that? I became tongue-tied. But Rabia, Rabia is a friend who has come to defend her. Uh, said aggressively, say what you have to say. Our bearded friend from snubbed her. I am talking to the Thakuran. I want an answer from her. I, it was the first time I had ever been addressed as the Thakuran. I am not aware of what jinn you are talking of and where he has sprung up from, Azmatullah Sahab. I am talking of the jinn in LM's body, Fozia Begum's daughter's body. Keeping, uh, keeping a jinn in the body is a sin. It is written in the Quran Sharif. It is as bad as cohabiting with someone. I looked at Rabia. Even she was taken aback. He went on, and it is specified that there are two types of jinns, Muslim jinns and non-Muslims, Gair <laughs> Musliman. Once, fortunately, Barkat, Barkat is the brother of Rabia, he intervened here. What about six jinns and Yahudi jinns, Malvi Sahib, <laughs> and have the Muslim jinns been circumcised? Or how would you know that they are Muslim jinns? I have no time to answer absurd questions. Fazul ke sawalat. I am only competent through Allah's meher to eradicate a Muslim jinn. Barkat persisted. Do you have a certificate? I told you, Barkat Mia, that I have no time for absurd questions. It was my turn to ask, Azmatullah Sahab, how will you eradicate the jinn? By reading ayats from the Quran. You will not beat the girl? Allah Qasam, I will not. How will you know that the jinn has left the body? I asked and Barkat followed up by saying, Will you shirko some itru on him so that we know by the smell that the guy has fizzed out? But Elham had heard it all. She was 12 years or 10 years. That, that's 14. about the age I am talking about. 14 years, uh, I think. Possibly the book may say something else. <laughs> she came out and stood defiantly there and said, I will not go to this man or anyone wanting to drive a boot out of me. There is no one inside me. I am there inside myself. And she went back in and banged the door. She was almost uh, semi semi helper in the house. I have now the... Seema says. Now Shalini mm. is talking about just one small mm. paragraph, if you don't mind. I have a confession to make. I have never really got into LM's problems because she comes across as a closed door. I'm not trying to deflect my own shortcomings. She must have been very confused with her own visions or hallucinations, call it what you will. I felt incompetent to deal with this psycho babble, and I didn't wish to deflect her from whatever she was up to in this dubious near occult field of hers. I found myself low on taboo and empathy. Uh, but also low on empathy. Sorry, I'll read that again. I found myself low on taboo, but also low on empathy. I tried to empathize with her. Did I? But it is not easy to move into another's 
sufferings. Suffering is a palisaded, not always welcome intruders. Thank you. From the Lucknow of from the Lucknow of the late 70s, we move to Allahabad. Turn of the century, Allahabad. Uh, one of the motives of writing this book was my conviction that we need to preserve every record of that inclusive world which we observe to be threatened now. The passages I have chosen are just, you know, randomly they, are, uh, they have to do uh, with whatever we remember of that inclusive world. My character converts to Islam and uh, I use this to explore this shared culture between Hindus and Muslims in my city. Inhabiting the music world in cities that possessed a culture of rich coexistence and exchange, the social category of the artist was somewhat irrelevant since the art itself was the faith. Still, faith often indwelt the art. Religion both mattered and did not matter. Hindu mythology had, interestingly enough, consigned performers to the Shudra domain. The Natya Shastra, that divine textbook for actors, dancers and singers, conceived in the mind of Brahma as the fifth Veda and materialized through the agency of Bharat Muni, was taught by the latter to his hundred sons. But, goes the story, those sons, grown arrogant with time, took to ridiculing the rishis in their compositions and performances, whereupon the rishis laid a curse on them. Henceforth, all this singing and dancing and acting would be the business of shudras and women. Abul Fazl has various musical subcasts: Dhari, Kawal, Hurakya, Dafzan, Natwa, Kalavant, Kirtanya. Musical function defined a performer's subcast, but religion was different. Tansen was a Kalavant. But whether he was a Hindu or a Muslim was an issue hotly debated for long. Whether he was a disciple of the Hindu saint Haridas or the Muslim saint Sheikh Muhammad Ghos was a question that provoked furious disagreement. He had two Hindu sons and two Muslim sons, but multiple marriages were common. And what's more interesting is that he had two graves, one beside that of his peer, Sheikh Muhammad Ghos in Gwalior, and the other in Vrindavan, and no one knows which, or if any, is the real one. It was latterly held that his real guru was Muhammad Adil Shah Adali. Some sources claim that he was a Brahmin from Gwalior, others that he was a Telang or a Gaur. A compromise position states that Haridas was his Kavya Guru and Ghos his music guru. But whether he was Hindu or Muslim remains unproved, and in musical tradition he is both. As to his funeral, it is not even known whether he was buried or cremated. The Persian word used in the Akbar Nama is Supurdekhak which only translates as confined to the dust. There are stirring examples of enormous individual bonding in the world of music of Hindu and Muslim maestros living together in common households. Bade Nisar Hussain Khan lived as a member of Shankar Pandit's orthodox Brahmin home in perfect reciprocal accommodation but for the absence of meat in his diet, for which, and for opium, a silver coin was placed under his pillow every morning by his host. 
the guest for his part, put on a dhoti after his daily bath and sandal paste on his forehead, and even carried on a recitation contest in Sanskrit shlokas with his hosts. He was given to saying that in his previous birth, he had been a pandit named Nisar Bhatt. The two visited the Jagannath temple in Puri and the Kaligat temple in Calcutta and sang bhajans there. There is the example of Bairam Khan of Jaipur, who lived for 12 years disguised as a Brahmin to learn Sanskrit and study the ancient musicology texts, applying tilak on his forehead, and even engaging in rituals like the Sandhya Vandanam, which was the Hindu temple's even song. But all the while, honorably keeping out of those temples which denied entry to Muslims. And at the end of his stay, having studied texts like the Sangeet Ratnakar and the Sangeet Kalpadram, confessing the truth of being a Muslim at his guru's feet, giving his reason for the pretense and asking his forgiveness and blessing, which was readily granted. Most striking is the example of Abdul Karim Khan singing a Marathi bhajan before Sai Baba at Shirdi, the words of which were, Lord, I ask only this of thee, that in my heart thou may forever be. Sai Baba is said to have told those present, See how yearningly this Muslim lad renders this hymn, and with what softness he prays to receive the Lord's grace. Unlike the lot of you, who pray as though you are hectoring the Lord to grant your prayers. Sai Baba invited Abdul Karim Khan to live in Shirdi with his Hindu wife and children, which he did for a while. When he left, he was given a silver rupee with a blessing and asked never to spend it, but keep it as a talisman. Abdul Karim sang in Hindu temples and Muslim shrines with the same deep devotion, urging his Hindu pupils to visit Hindu holy places and bearing all their travel expenses. His Hari Om Tatsat in Rag Malkons and his Ram Dhuns were appreciated by Lokmanya Tilak and Mahatma Gandhi and the latter even expressed a desire to take Abdul Karim with him on his various tours to Indian cities so that Hindus and Muslims, growing increasingly hostile to one another again by British machinations, could hear him and be recalled to their senses. What a deeply moving and timely reminder. It was truly, Allahabad was truly Sangam, the Hindu tradition, the Muslim tradition, and the modern Indian, uh, the independent, that came from the freedom struggle, all of it together, right? Uh, now, the last uh, reading from Surya Lakshmi Villa. You have a mic, right? Where's your mic? Uh, I'll be reading a portion from the, the Muslim section, that was the Muslim family. It's about a, a girl uh, of 12 who is uh, abused by her father. She has this very, very deep and, and very emotive bond with her grandmother who was burned as a witch. And, um, uh, and she uh, visits the graveyard of her grandmother whenever she needs solace. So I just, uh, her name is Eid Ulvara, but uh, her, she's called Eidun. It's set in 1956, Malda. Eidun was 12 when her father fell in love with her. Her body had just started putting out tender sprigs with tiny buds rippling at the tips. Her mind was a sea of rain-washed leaves, tremulous and teary, brimming over. Perhaps that was the reason her father fell in love with her. He liked to see women weep. On the nights when he drew the sack curtain against the others, Idun rose from her katha at first light and stepping over the crumbling wall of the mosque, came and stood in the graveyard. I, Idun, her dead grandmother, 
beckoned to her with skeletal fingers, and the dying moon and stars nodded their heads at the girl. Idun sank on her haunches by the Aush vine that had pushed a pale green shoot through the brown earth of Zaitun Bibi's grave six months ago and now ran lush and wanton all over it. Olo, o oh, Idun, the dead woman's voice called in a cracked whisper. Why do you weep? Nani go. Idun let her tears fall on the spiky leaves and paddy gold flowers of the Aush. Why don't you take me in your arms and let me lie beside you to sleep under the moon and stars? Hush, child. The ancient voice rumbled from a film-filled throat. Why should you lie beside me? There's bath in your father's house. Eat your fill and wait for the prince who is coming for you. Prince? Idun's voice was resentful. There is no prince. There is. There must be. You were born for some other world, some other destiny. You will live your life with someone kind and beautiful. You will know love such as you've never known before. I knew that the moment you were born. Be patient. Wait. Wait. The voice wavered like a dying flame and was snuffed out as an enormous crimson sun tilted its head precariously from the edge of Pannajuri Lake. Don't go, Nani, don't go. Idun flung herself on the grave, the rough leaves and fronds of the Aush chafing her tender breasts. Take me with you. But the grandmother was gone, and so were the moon and stars with her. And now the sun rose, a great flaming orb, against which a cloud of bats wheeled, their crooked wings moving in languorous silence. Idun trem trembled, and balls of sweat, large and heavy as raindrops, broke out all over her body. The night of dread was over, but another day and another night awaited her. Bath! Zaitun Bibi's grave, a voice, came to her ears in a long, drawn-out cloak. Bath! Idun's lips twisted in a bitter smile. In the last days of her life, Nani had thought and spoken of nothing but Bhat, and the obsession had followed her to the grave. We'll stay with you, Arunadi, for a second. And I want to ask you, I want to ask all three of you, about the structuring of your novels. The structure. When you were writing it, uh, yours is very interesting because it goes back and forth in time. And there are many different points of view that come in, including that of the eponymous house Sura Lakshmi Villa, right? How deliberate was that? Or was it sort of playful and you, f while writing, you did things? No, you see, uh, as I told you, that uh, it all started from that one incident of this woman leaving her husband and child and walking off. And, uh, and then it seemed to me that uh, there would be reasons for whatever she did and why she did it. And the fact that everybody would, would see her action in a particular kind of a way, in his or her own kind of a way. So because to me, I feel that truth, there's no such thing as the whole truth. Truth is multiple. Everyone just catches that part of the truth which suits uh, her, him or her. Usually each has an agenda and they just see one part, one aspect of the truth and they take it as the whole truth. Whereas I felt that there must be many, 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 many truths behind this, uh, whatever happened. So that's why I thought of different people and this book has been structured in, in this uh, very uh, strange kind of a way because the story is actually told in the prologue. The That's story right. is right That's there. Right. Is, the whole story is told in the prologue. That's right. And it actually each, and then um, each one's version follows. That's right. Her character, her friends, her relatives, her, even her son, her, her sisters, her cousin, her friends, friend, good friend, they tell the story in their own way. And in telling her story, they are also revealing, the, they are also their telling story. their own stories. So in a sense, a double story is being told. So this, I uh, thought, was a very 
interesting way of dealing or talking about a particular incident because it shows that and th uh, it shows the truth is multiple for, uh, for one thing. For another, this is how the layers and nuances of a character. Because all characters are complex, whatever you of may course, say. No character is straight, simple. Right. So all characters are sim uh, complex. And this is how the layers and nuances of the yeah. character Like little is bits revealed. of a puzzle yeah. that, exactly. that only come together in the reader's head eventually. And the final bit of the puzzle, I thought, could be told only by the house, by the walls. And that's why the book is called Surya Lakshmi Villa, because Surya Lakshmi Villa is really the most important character. Right. Because the walls of the house really know, can see what is happening and will relate. It will we'll just tell the facts. But in this book, Surya Lakshmi Villa is not only given a voice, but Surya Lakshmi Villa is also given a spirit. Right. You know, and um, uh, th there's a distinct relationship between her, between Surya Lakshmi Villa and Surya Lakshmi, and which evolves also. Surya Lakshmi also evolves with time, and so does the villa. Right. The villa grows old. It's, uh, you know, this, this uh, growing together, evolving together, growing old together, and, and then getting cast out together right. is, uh, I thought, uh, you know, would be an interesting way of telling the story. It, it works very well, I must tell you. It's very successful. Uh, Neelamji, in your case, you let the imagination soar and go deep in, in, in reimagining the life of Janaki. But like in writing a sonnet, you're also constrained by certain facts of her life, right? So in that, in structuring the novel, her, her past, you've given perhaps the most amount of play to, to, to the years when she emerged mm -hmm. as an artist, mm -hmm. found her voice, and then her later years, which, which are more condensed. How deliberate was it? Uh, <coughs> the book is called Ra uh, Requiem in Rag Janke. And it's fortunate that uh, the central trope is that of music and the rag. Now, if we consider an Indian rag, there are some basic notations. There's a basic alphabet of notes. However, one can improvise. One can depart from that standard alphabet. One can meander, one can wander, take a flight, and return so long as the basic notation remains the same. So the structure of this novel actually followed that. The rug. Oh. And uh, there were documented uh, biographical details. They formed the central alphabet of this life story. Mm. Whereas the play of imagination and also the reflection about that kind of society right. and the folklore which I strung along, yes. they could be like the musical improvisation. Yes. So that's the way I just instinctively went with the flow right. of the music of right. the book. So the novel itself is performed in Rag Janki. That's, that's brilliant. That's really genius there. And letters, right? Most of the novel, Letters to Mama, is actually letters. Letters written by a daughter. And yet, they are much more than letters, right? It's a they novel of ideas. Letters. They are not letters, they are narratives. And uh, the way of uh, writing it is that she keeps talking to her mother. So why did uh, you choose... Her dead mother. So it's narratives, not really letters. They are, and, and as she says right in the beginning, that these will never be posted. Right? These are sort of her coming of age through the writing. But why letters? Quickly and then we move on to uh, one, the audience. One, one minute. Uh, the uh, novel speaks for itself. It's a living being. Uh, it develops itself. The right. characters develop, the plot also develops. You don't right. have a blueprint. It's not a house being built or an right. apartment being built. I mean, that's the difference between, uh, uh, I suppose it would be the same with a musical composition. When somebody is coming up with a, you know, uh, a big requiem or something, uh, it, it goes on and the nuances and the notes and the melody uh, changes. Uh, it's the same with a novel. Yes, right. you were saying something. Right. Now, let's open it up to our wonderful audience. 
uh, questions. Is there anyone who can pass the mic around? This gentleman? Okay, then. Is it, uh, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Yagya. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I have this journal wandering for a while and I want to, I want to share this. So sometimes I feel that everything I write, everything you write, everything you create is just an amalgamation of all the things that you have seen, everything you've read, everything that you have experienced. Uh, and if you bear me down of all my experiences, am I anything? Like, if, if not all my experiences, am I anything? That's a very deep question from a young writer, I would imagine. W would you like to take it? Uh, this is a daunting question, but uh, we are compositions. Are we compositions in some over being's mind? I do not know. Are we compositions in our own mind? What will happen to us when the composition unravels at the moment of death? Or do we add the concluding chapter only then? I, we do not, your question really, nobody can answer. Uh, but I do think that there must be some little residual vestige of all that has been distilled from our exposure to the world. I don't think that if you are pared down, you will be reduced to zero. Something must remain. You keep writing. You keep writing. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Siv, uh, budding writer, I would say, actually. Uh, written a couple of novels. My question is, and I have read uh, Requiem Raga Janaki because I was at the Hindu Lit Fest last year. I, you Where know, the book I, won Yeah, the I purchased award. the book right there, in fact, and completely read it, in fact. The other two, Dadu, Daruwalas and Aruna Chakrabarti, I made to read. I'm going to do it. My question is, as a writer, basically, evolving writer, See, this has been a question in, my, in me for a long, long time actually. How to balance fact and fiction? Like how much did you balance between these two actually? Now, I'm not expecting figures to be given out actually. What is the dynamics? Like, you know, like because I want to write uh, a historical fiction. I'm in the process. Right. So, will you please answer this? All, all of the three of you can answer this. Arunath, do you want to take it first? Because this is a question that we discussed yesterday. Uh, yeah, before I answer your question, I'll just, uh, I'd like to tell you that I've, I've just written two books, which are books of historical fiction. And um, they, are, uh, they deal with the lives of the women of the Tagore family, Jora Shako and daughters of Jora Shako. Now, I was just faced with your problem and what, exactly what you faced. I've gone through it, so I can just speak of my experience. You see, I wanted to write about the women of the Tagore family because the men of the Tagore family are so well known, but nobody knows anything about the women. And so, of course, it began with uh, with a sense of curiosity that could it be possible that a family brought so much change they were you know the harbingers practically of the bengal renaissance and the women played no role it, it could just couldn't have happened so i wanted to write about the women but when i started researching them i found there was no material at all except a few letters that they had written and uh, that Tagore's had a magazine in which the, everybody wrote something. But women being women, being daughters-in-law, were not very open, you know. I, they, right. In fact, all they wrote were, were uh, wonderful things about the family and how lucky they were and etc. But it seemed to me that that couldn't be the truth. They were, they were definitely keeping back a lot of the truth. And so I, I just picked up little, little hints from various places, uh, uh, from various parts of uh, what they had written in their letters and uh, in fact a lot that Rabindranath Tagore himself wrote you know in his own uh, life I mean about his own life um, a few stray phrases a few stray sentences gave me an idea of uh, you know what could have been the truth and what could have been the truth of course was fiction because I made it up you know so that's the way I tried to balance uh, fact and fiction because the, the essential 
fact was there. That was documented, that even had a date and everything. But everything around it, the thoughts of the women, the, the dreams that they dreamt, the ambitions that they had, the, the way they were caught between two different worlds, you know, uh, a conservative world which was pulling them back and another world which was pushing them forward and the dilemma that they, that they faced, uh, th that is entirely fiction. So that's the way I, I worked. That's the way I worked. Kiki, do you want to add something? Uh, you have to differentiate fiction and historical fiction. I mean, if you set a piece of fiction in, say, the 18th century, that doesn't become necessarily historical fiction. You can talk about a family, you can talk about a family emigrating to the Americas, uh, India's indentured labor going out, or even a slave family from Mozambique or Biafra to being shipped across is not necessarily historical, historical fiction. fiction. I feel historical fiction is when you talk about historical characters. If you talk about Wolf or Wellesley or um, uh, the Indian, Indian Viceroy, you know, the, uh, the, the one who was bombed in the Hardinge in 1912, uh, that becomes, uh, that portion, that, that figures here, that portion becomes historical fiction. But otherwise, uh, you have set your scene in uh, 50 years back or 60 years back. It does not necessarily mean historical fiction. That's all. We have time for one last question. Lady, yes, young lady here. Hello, sir. So I just wanted to ask, I'm extremely curious because we are studying your poem, Winter, right now in our school. That is so, so lovely. <laughs> your poem. So I wanted we to We all ask, studied his poems in school, <laughs> I think. What inspired you to write your very first poem? And like, what was it really about? And when did you write at what age? Your very first poem. I come from a family where my father was a professor and he had uh, about thousands of books. So I let, uh, read literature right from uh, when I was a schoolboy. And it, this went on and on. Uh, the first things I wrote were two silly short stories at the age of 12 or something. Then I left everything. And then my poems really came up when a uh, friend died in a road accident, then I forgot poetry again. But when once I joined service, I said, I'm, I can't now go to drama or fiction because I <laughs> did my MA in literature. He was and a I was very officer, fond of drama way. and very fond of um, fiction. But I said, I'll stick to poetry, and which I did. Thank you. And of, uh, something that he told me many years ago, which stuck in my head, is that he would write the poems and his secretary would type them out, right? <coughs> in the police officer days, your secretary would type them out, right? <laughs> All right, do we have, we have one and a half minutes, so, uh, okay, right. last question, yeah, yeah. and then we're out. Oh, well, as far as I know, that music uh, is in, Muslim uh, women can go out to sing of a particular class, lower class that also. Hindu women were always in Partha. Even last year we had a women's up program where a woman from a rural area came to sing. She was a very good singer, a classical singer. She sang in a gungat. She wouldn't pick up a gungat. So how come Janki Devi chose music as a career? Was it a family thing or she chose herself? And how was she accepted by society? And what class did she belong to? Uh, Janki was a courtesan. Janki, Janki uh, was a practicing prostitute. And she is very cagey about that in her own, you know, in her autobiography. 
she makes light of it because she didn't need to practice after a while. She was, she was abducted and she was brought up in a kotha and that is where she was exposed to the best ustads of the time and she was groomed in all the lore of music and groomed very well in classical music. So that way, you know, she, she really belonged to that subcategory. She was a Hindu woman, but for personal reasons, she converted to Islam and she lived as a devout Shia Muslim woman for the end, till the end of her life. Thank you, everyone. We are out of time. This has been a, you've been a wonderful audience. And the last very important thing, their books are available in the bookstore. And uh, Keki and Neelam have already uh, signed copies there. Arunaji is going to go and sign copies there now. Please buy your copies and read them. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. We would like to thank Keki and Dharuwala, Aruna Chakravati, Neelam Sarangar, and Dev Priya Roy. And also the sponsor, the Tribune, Voice of the People. Next session begins at 3.45, session number 28, A State at Any Cost, The Life of David Ben-Gurion.